I don't recall singing that song, but I would like to sing it again and again. That was wonderful, especially as we're dealing with the heart of anger this morning. Uh, the, the line in there that talked about purifying our attitudes and thoughts and deeds. What a, what a wonderful uh, challenge and blessing that is today. Um, I don't know that girl, in case you think I do, I don't. So um, just keep your eye. Uh, so I, I pulled her off the internet somewhere in uh, photos. That's how it goes. Let's take a minute and read together. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, we'll read verses 21 through 27. Our Savior uh, spoke these words these many years ago. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come quickly or come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. All of us, if we know ourselves, and I think it becomes more apparent as we become parents, uh, there are certain things that, that we don't have to teach our children. We really don't. They just know them inherently. And, and I think we could probably start with the Ten Commandments and just work through each one of those, right? And the heart of your child and even your heart is such that you have a bent towards breaking every single one of those. You really do. We don't have to teach our children to lie. It's something that we all just know by heart. Unfortunately, anger and aggression are both natural to us. I ask permission before I gave these, before I would give these illustrations, so as I throw my family under the bus, just know that they said, okay. Um, when Caleb was about four, three, four, five years old, he, he started going around to everybody and saying, let's fight. And he would do this, and, and I'm like, where in the world is this coming from? And I, Paige, you're homeschooling him. What, what are you teaching him here? You know, these types of things. And, and it was really cute and fun, but one kid took him seriously, and that wasn't cute and fun, and it didn't go so well for him. But, but, but the point is this. Why is this the case? Why are we just quick to do that? And I know specifically, you know, let's fight is something that my heart sort of resonates with too. And uh, I think we're seeing a whole lot of that in our society today. Let's fight. Let's get after it. But why is this the case? Well, it's part of our fallenness. It really is. Um, my got questions question this week had to do with original sin. And uh, the questioner was asking and saying, well, based on Ezekiel 18, where it says the children won't pay for the father's sin and the fathers won't pay for the sons or the children's sin, that, that means original sin is not true, right? Well, I went through and said, no, it's true. And outlined that from the place and said, you know, what's going on in this Ezekiel passage is that dad commits sin and he has punishment for that. And the kid isn't going to be punished for dad's particular sin, same vice versa. Uh, but the reality is, is that both of them are considered sinners in that passage. And both of them will pay for their own sins. And when it comes to children, pain for the sins of their father or God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on their children. Kids do reap the consequences of our sin. And not just kids, but everybody. But original sin is real. We are born with a fallen nature. We are born with a proclivity to do things that are sinful. Paul describes it this way. Now the works of the flesh are evident. This is Galatians 5, 19 and 21 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
And if you're thinking correctly, you find yourself in that list, if not just in many of those, at least a couple, I do. But, but the challenge for us, as it is for everyone, is that we need to come to understand the gravity of these attitudes, the gravity of these sins. It's one thing just to, to read a list. It's another thing completely to uh, buy into what's being said, to understand the gravity of what's going on. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking specifically about anger. And notice in that uh, Galatians passage, there's enmity, strife, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. All of those, of course, are manifestations of sinful anger. They really are. A brief review from last week, uh, as we looked at an overview of this entire section of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, this is commentator R.T. French. Uh, what Jesus is doing here, he, he's calling us to not just simply look at the exterior, but rather he's promoting an inward concern with motive and attitude above the outward focus and the visible quantification of the observance of regulations. He's going behind specific rules to look for the far more far-reaching principles that should govern the conduct of God's people. Its concern is not so much with the negative goal of avoidance of sin, but with the far more demanding positive goal of discovering and following what really is the will of God here. It substitutes for what is a principle, it substitutes for what is in principle 100% achievable righteousness. The avoidance of breaking a definable set of regulations with a totally open-ended ideal being perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. It will always remain beyond the grasp of the most committed disciple. Such a radically searching reading of the will of God in the light of the Old Testament law establishes a righteousness of the kingdom of heaven which is in a different league altogether from the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees and of any other religious traditions which understand the will of God in terms of punctilious observance of rules. That's what's going on here. That's what Jesus is doing. And so what we want to do here is we want to spend some time engaged with verses 21 through 25. And this is what we want to pull from this text here. Jesus demands that we understand the gravity of sinful anger and offload it in pursuit of reconciliation. You have that in your notes, you can go on. So as we look at this text, there's two ways we harbor sinful anger in our hearts. Two ways we do it. And number one, we are not considering the gravity of its wickedness. We're harboring it when we are not considering the gravity of its wickedness. Now again, if you're even glancing at the news right now, you, you, again, you see this growing rage and anger, the, the social media attacks and anger. You, you see things, people saying, well, this person does this and I'm never going to forgive them, ever. They're not going to do it. And as we as a society continue to offload the Judeo-Christian worldview in the West, it's going to be replaced with increasing tribalist mentalities and animosity. And that's what we're seeing right now. Thus, again, across the country, as I mentioned in the prayer, across the country right now, the murder rate has gone up by 30% in this past year. It's the highest single year increase ever. Now, there's more than one factor involved in that, but surely anger is on the rise, is it not? Is it not? The sad part of this is that the level of hate isn't simply increasing. The acceptance of it is increasing as well the acceptance of it is increasing well. Not is it only not bad, not only is it not bad to hate someone, in some circles, if you don't hate your opponent, you're being immoral. To not despise people on the other side of whatever issue is immoral. How could you not? Well, again, nothing new under the sun. Again, we look at Matthew 5.43, which we'll get to in a few weeks. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, again, this is, the one, this is the one section here where there's a complete wrong addition into the scriptures. The rest of these admonitions from Christ do fall back on scriptures. We'll get to that one. But we need to hope and pray that our society and culture has a rebirth of biblical attitudes uh, that we are to have towards one another. You should be praying for that. 
I hope you're praying for revival. Revival of your own heart. Revival here in Boulder. Revival of Colorado. Revival of the nation. Um, I was listening to a podcast this last week that um, the two guys were talking about that the track we're taking as a society, the only way it, it, it can finally end is through bloodshed. But they said, you know what? We can turn around before we get to that point. We can turn around before we get to that point. Let's pray that we do. Let's pray that we turn around. And of course, this morning, we have this incredibly helpful instruction from our Savior. Incredibly helpful. Jesus is dealing not directly with actual murder in this case. Rather, he's dealing with the source of murder. Sinful anger and hate in our heart. Verse 21, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Now, we look at this and, and immediately uh, within the context of what we just looked at over the past couple weeks, Jesus said, I didn't come to remove the law. I didn't come to set it off, but no, I came to fulfill it. And he says, I'm going to fulfill every iota, every dot, or not one iota or dot will be removed from the law until all is accomplished. So what Jesus is putting forth here is he's saying this, that the teachers of the law are not teaching the fullness of it in the case of murder. They're not doing it. And, and it, isn't, it isn't that what's said here isn't biblical and true, because it is. Both of these phrases here, you shall not murder, of course, that's Exodus 20, 13. Okay, both, and, and then this, this idea that you're going to be taken to the court, that's sort of a summation or taken under judgment. It's kind of a summation of all of the different admonitions against violence towards people. It's biblical. Upon being accused of murder, the one being charged was to be taken to court, so to speak. And, and in that society, you'll remember, all the cities had these big walls, and the walls had big gates that were, you know, the wall was, could have been 30, 50, 60 feet wide. And in the gate, there were these different compartments uh, that where people could do some business and stuff. And there was always a place where the elders of the city sat. And people who had complaints and concerns could go appeal to the elders. And so, so the idea here is that when someone uh, commits murder or they're accused of it, they're taken before a, a council. They're taken before uh, the elders of the city or the elders of the land. And, and there has to be an account given and evidence produced in this whole thing. All right, so everything here is true. Everything here that, that's said in verse 21 is true. So, so what is Jesus addressing here? It seems that this statement, verse 21, was the whole of the Pharisees' teaching on the topic of murder. That's it. You've heard that it was said, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. Now, for one, holding to a legalistic understanding of God's law, which is what the Pharisees were doing, this really makes some sense, doesn't it? Now, now you can understand that that some people might have the idea if I got up and, and did a huge biblical exposition on the topic of murder, uh, yeah, but this doesn't really apply to me, does it? I'm not, I've never killed anybody. I'm not planning on killing anybody. In fact, I, I, I tried to pick in my own head, do, do I know anyone that's killed anybody? Well, I had a relative in law enforcement, and yes, he had the most unfortunate responsibility to do so. He never talked about it, never wanted to talk about it. Heartbreaking stuff. But, but you, you sit there and think, the Pharisees are like, okay, we have this one, do not murder. Okay, do not sinfully take someone's life. Selfishness, whatever. It's a big sin. But, but also, even as big as it is, it's very rare. It really is. And that's good, right? It's good. So last year, 2019, not, not last year, uh, the, the murder rate was six for every 100,000 people. Uh, this year, again, goes up 30%, 7.8 this year. And if you do the math on that, uh, that's way, way less than one-tenth of 1%. One In fact, it's, you know, a hundredth of a 1%. It is really low. And so again, I, I would assume you're probably not going to run into anyone, or if you do, it's going to be very rare that you run on, run into someone who's a murderer. Now, so, so the idea here is, okay, look, we know we're not supposed to murder. We know there'll be punishment, but we really don't need to talk about this one. Check it off, be done. Let's move on. Same thing with adultery that we'll look at here in a couple weeks. 
right? Hey, you know, adultery is a big sin, but, you know, at least on the outside, it's not, it's not happening too much. And so we can just say it, move on, say it, move on. Everyone knows that murder is wrong. Therefore, perhaps we, we, we need not spend time on this. God's law says not to murder, so don't murder, and you'll be punished if you do. Okay, I'm good on that one. What else do I need to do? I'm good. It's like the rich young ruler of Mark 10. Uh, he, he goes and he asks Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, you know the commandments, don't murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And what's his statement to that? All these things I have done. What am I lacking? And, and when we quantify holiness by a list, we can say things, well, I've never killed anybody. I've not committed adultery. I, I've spoken well to my family. You know, I've not defrauded. We can say these things. And, and, and I've actually sat out here, or not sat, I've stood in this pulpit. This was years ago, looking out. And I said, everyone in this room has sinned by lying. Everyone has. And one person was sitting out there going, not me. I mean, they didn't say it, but they were shaking their head. I was like, you're lying right now. <laughs> I, did, I didn't say that. But, but again, I mean, sometimes we think that. Sometimes we think, well, I'm, you know, on the day of judgment, you know, I, I can take these things. I've not murdered. I've not committed adultery. I've not lied. Da, 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 da. And so I'm good on those areas. I'm good on those areas. And since it's clear that killing is wrong, we don't need to spend too much time on it. But if we're truly going to understand God's attitude towards murder, it's going to require a bit more effort. It's going to require a bit more thoughtfulness on our part. What does the Old Testament say about murder? Well, earliest part, we, we read the account in Genesis 4 this morning, the first murder. And we see how, the, how the, the attitude of Cain is sourced in an angry heart there. It's sourced in an angry heart. But we have these passages, the earliest one, Genesis 9, 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed for God made man in his own image. Exodus 21, 12 through 14. Whoever strikes the man so that he dies shall be put to death. But if he did not lie in wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place to which he may flee. But if a man willfully attacks another to kill him by cunning, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. Leviticus 24, 17. Whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death. Numbers 35, 31, 30 through 31. If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the evidence of witnesses. But no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Moreover, you shall accept no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall be put to death. There's a lot more we could go, but, but that by itself adds some weightiness to this issue. It really does. And specifically that Genesis 9, 6 passage. He says, you will not kill people. You should not kill people. And, and if you do, you will be put to death because I made man in my own image. And I have this, you know, when, when I sit there and I think about the different strictures or, or outlining or listing of sins that God, through the Holy Spirit, in the inspired writers lists, I think a lot of them you can find the positive principle early in the Old Testament. You can find the positive principle by which all of us should live by. And then God in his kindness says, well, okay, I gave you the positive principle and here's what the negative looks like. And so in Genesis 1 and 2, what do we know about marriage? What did Jesus affirm about marriage in Matthew 19? One man, one woman, one flesh for life. Done. That's all, that's, all Jesus, that's all God needed to say to us, right? Here it is. Boom. One man, one woman, one flesh for life. Boom. And friends, if that's all we had, it's more than enough. It's more than enough to hold us accountable. It really is. But in kindness, what does he do? He outlines. Well, what does it look like when you're abusing this? Well, I kind of view this Genesis 9, 6 passage in the same way. Don't kill. Why? Because I made man in my image. And when you kill, what? You're assaulting me. You're assaulting me. We could go on and develop this more and more and more. 
But even looking at the account about Cain killing Abel, if we're being humble and thoughtful before the text, what do we see? Cain was very angry and his face fell. His face fell. What is the source? Where does murder arise? Thus, when Jesus takes on the topic of murder here, he isn't simply skipping over it. He's thoroughly addressing the entire issue and he's speaking truth about it. So he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not murder and anyone who murders shall be liable to the judgment. Well, then he goes on in verse 22, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council and whoever says you fool shall be liable to the hell of fire. So... (laughs) Again, the Pharisees throughout their life and their teaching, they're saying, just don't kill anybody, you're fine. Jesus is saying, no, if you're thinking wicked thoughts towards somebody, if you're angry with your brother, the same judgment that went for someone who actually killed somebody is the same for you. The same for you. If you insult somebody, it's the same that you go and you have to give an account. For insulting someone. If you call someone a fool, you you might go to hell. Pretty intense words, isn't it? Pretty intense stuff. And again, shock. People heard this, they're like, what? If I'm angry, I could be judged for that? If I call someone a moron, I'm going to go to hell? Really? Really? You see, friends, we scoff at that idea. In our flesh, we scoff at the idea of anyone being put on trial for thoughts and words. We would never do that. Freedom of speech is one of our primary essential freedoms. And the freedom, that freedom allows us to insult one quite vociferously, quite viciously. But we do put people on trial for actual physical violence and we punish them. But what Jesus is saying here, what he's implying is that because we humans are limited in our ability to deal with people, in in our pursuit of justice, it's never going to be 100% right. Oftentimes it's not even close. It's sad to watch our justice system at times abuse people and hurt them. And I, I mean, I'm, I really enjoy, enjoy is not the right word, but, but following the innocence project and seeing those things and how those are worked out. You know, but, but, but I mean, we can't do it. We can only deal with outside actions. That's it. We can only deal with outside actions. Just as long as our outside actions don't break God's law, we can do anything we want with our mind. And friends, I, I, I support that basic concept within our American system. I really do. And I think it's something that's very valuable that we have freedom of speech, freedom to think what we want, but not in God's economy, not in God's court, not in God's judgment. We don't have that right. We don't have that right. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are never simply concerned with our outside actions. They're never simply concerned with our outside actions. Why is this the case? Well, look what Jesus says here. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 1 John 3, 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Just hating someone makes me a killer? Yep. You know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Here's Proverbs 26, 24 through 26. Whoever hates disguises himself with his lips, harbors deceit in his heart. When he speaks graciously, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Though his hatred be covered with deception, his wickedness will be exposed in the assembly. Luke 16, 15. You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts, for what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Romans 2.16, Paul says, there's going to come a day when according to the gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. He does that. Really heartbreaking story that Paige and I have from a relative that died many, many, many years ago. 
And uh, as this person was dying of cancer, Paige and I were visiting and trying to share the gospel, and he was viciously opposed is the only way to describe it. Hostilely not interested in hearing this. And I don't remember the exact context, but, but something about President Obama came up in the conversation. He just spewed vile. He spewed vile about President Obama. And in the context of that, I, one of us, it may have been me, it may have been Paige, it, trying, to, trying to wake him up, we said, you, you know, those words and the motivations behind them are going to be judged by God. Are you prepared for that? And his response was, God understands this anger. I'm like, good luck with that one. We don't know if he ever came to faith. He never did in our presence, but he, he died several weeks later. We don't know. We can hope. One day, God will judge not simply our actions, but our motivations and our thoughts. And and friends, if those wicked thoughts, those anger, unjustified anger, things where we're putting ourselves above others, you see the quote, which we'll look at at the end again that I have in the bulletin, anger shows contempt. You are better than they. You are smarter, more righteous. You are above and they are below. Anger tears down. It kills relationships. Friends, we're going to stand before the Lord. And if, if these things are not repented of, if these things are not repented of, sinful internal anger that is never known by anyone else will qualify you for the fire of hell. Fire of hell. That's a shocking statement, isn't it? That's a shocking statement. Brothers and sisters, do you understand the gravity of sinful anger? Do you understand the gravity of it? Are you considering the depth of its wickedness? Jesus' words here were absolutely shocking. Remember at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. And I hope and pray that these words astonish you. They astonish me. And I hope and pray that they begin to astonish our community and our world again. We're harboring sinful anger in our hearts when we don't consider the gravity of the wickedness and we are not seeking to offload it and be reconciled to those with whom we struggle. It's one thing to be made aware of our anger, right? It's one thing to realize that, oh goodness, these thoughts are something that displeases God. And that's good. That's good, right? Uh, Jesus lays it out and says, if you're angry, you're in trouble. And, and it's good for us to recognize that sinful anger displeases God. But that isn't simply enough. Jesus doesn't stop there. He takes it to another level. He gives us these couple of illustrations here. Verse 23, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there and go before the altar or go leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come quick, come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you that you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. Now, as we, as we look at these words, friends, uh, they have both what we would consider a literal meaning as well as that deeper spiritual truth at which Jesus is getting at, okay? Uh, as in verses 21 and 22, Jesus doesn't mention the heart in those verses. He doesn't say a word about the heart, but that's what he's getting at. That's what he's getting at. And that's the same with these verses that we just read. And now, now we think about the context where Jesus, this is the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, the Sermon on the Mount occurs up in Galilee, Northern Israel. And, you know, you and I, we come to church here and we can put our money in the offering plates or the offering box. We can take communion. We can sing and do all these things. And and it's not too big of a deal. But there was one altar in Jerusalem where people were um, to give worshipful gifts. It was in Jerusalem. So 30-mile trip. So you, you can imagine this. He's speaking in Galilee and someone's listening to him. You mean you're telling me that if I'm on my way to Jerusalem, I go down there and I'm getting to go into the temple and I'm going to offer my whatever sacrifice and all of a sudden this thought comes to me that I stole the neighbor's corn or something like that back up in Galilee and I need to go make that right. Do they have corn 
It was in, in, in old English, corn is another word for wheat. So yes, in the King James Version, it says corn. And that's one of the things that uh, uh, some people will attack the Bible on. There's no corn in ancient Israel. Well, the word itself can refer to wheat. So stole, stole somebody's wheat, all right? And you remember that. Are you saying, Jesus, that I need to leave my animal or my grain or the bird or whatever it is and hike back up 30 miles? Seek reconciliation with my neighbor? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I, I just wonder in my own heart, am I, would I be willing to just drive across town? Talk to someone who's offended me or I've offended? Is that something I'm willing to do? So there is. There, there really is this literal idea that if, if I'm harboring sin or I have some sinful relationship going on, I need to deal with that. I need to deal with it now. You know, not, not okay, I'm going to go worship the Lord right now, and, and then I'll go and deal. No, no, the emphasis here is that you need to deal with this. Is the statement to be taken literally? Yeah, worshiping God while pursuing or maintaining a sinful attitude and state is not only pointless, it's offensive to God. Psalm 66, 18 if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened to me. You know the context of Isaiah. Uh, the nation has walking away from God. They've been rejecting him for many years now. And God in his kindness sends prophets like Isaiah to, to call them back, to call them to repentance. And so in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 through 17, we hear this. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now think about that. That's an insult. That's a big one. He's calling the people of Israel and Judah, you are like Sodom and Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have, an, I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Summary, if we're harboring sin of any type, God isn't interested in our worship until that's taken care of. Just not interested. Maybe, friends, this has happened to me. You've hit a plateau in your spiritual growth, or maybe you've even gone backwards a little bit. Okay. And you're, you're trying to figure out why. It could be any number of reasons. There might be some lack of discipline in your life in some area that God would like you to start delighting in, and you're not. But maybe just maybe you're harboring sinful, angry thoughts that you need to deal with. And God, in his kindness, will not let you move forward until this is dealt with by the blood of Jesus. I've had lots of people leave the church. You know how it is, it's just church life. And years ago, we had a couple leave and they'd been offended by somebody in the church. They'd been hurt and I think the offense was legit. And nothing, they were right. What happened was offensive. But they came in and they said, well, well, we're leaving. We're, we're out of here. And I said, no, you, you shouldn't do that. You, you need to go to this person and seek reconciliation. Well, they just flat out said, no, we're not doing that. We're just, we're just out of here. And I said to them, well, let me tell you something. God is faithful. God is faithful. And you're going to get offended everywhere you go until you decide to deal with this. 
until you get your heart right before the Lord and you start dealing with this internal anger, this, Im- I didn't, so I'm getting on a roll now, this immaturity, this thoughtlessness, this unbiblical attitude, until you are willing to engage with people who hurt you, God's not going to let you go and you're going to keep on getting offended. Now, never seen him again, so I don't know. I don't know. But that's the truth, friends. God is faithful. And if there's an area of immaturity, if there's an area of sin in your life right now, if there's something that you're just trying to bury and you don't want to deal with it, mm, God's going to deal with it. If you're truly a believer, if the Holy Spirit's really in your life, he won't let you off the hook. And praise be to God. Praise be to God that he doesn't let us off the hook. Deal with it. Deal with it. Jesus then gives this second illustration about going to court. And and so he has this one where maybe you're offended in the first or or there's an offense, there's a difference. But now there's a court case. He he, he lifts up, he lifts up the, the gravity of the situation. And he says, look, you know this, that when you, when you go to court, it's much better if you get this taken care of before you go to court so you don't end up in debtor's prison, which is something we're not familiar with at all, but something that's been common throughout history. You know, and, and you need to be actively pursuing those whom you've offended and deal with this. Deal with this. And, and so you've offended somebody, somebody you're, you're in conflict with somebody, you sit down together and you talk it out. You talk it out. And this flows right out of the Beatitudes. Remember the Beatitudes are a description of those who belong to Christ. Blessed are the. Blessed are the. These are present, active things. Okay. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. And again, this isn't just simply this idea that I'm going to get, I'm going to get between two warring parties and separate them. What's that statement that the way the world defines peace is when everybody stops to reload at the same time? Is that it? That's, that's not what Jesus means, okay? That's not what Jesus means. Bringing actual peace, bringing the, the, the gospel, the love of Christ, the, the forgiveness and mercy of God into a situation and Friends, you need to be quick to be seeking forgiveness. You really do. If you've done something and, and, and you're at edge with somebody and something's going on there, hey, make it right. Make it right. Go to it. What, is G, what, are, what words of Paul do we have here in Romans 12? Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all, if possible. So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Now, we understand that there's going to be some relationships that are really hard. And some relationships where there is animosity and it remains that way. All of us understand estrangement, unfortunately. It's just the way that it is. But the question that I think you should be wrestling with, have you done what you can to, to mend the bridge? And if the, the other party refuses, that's, that's not your responsibility. That's why Paul says, as far as it concerns you, all right, is the door open to reconciliation? Are you welcoming this? Are you willing to do this? Or are you like the father who got mad at his daughter and for her doing something and the brother recommended that dad forgive the daughter and dad said, I'd rather go to hell than forgive her. And the son responded and said, God will grant you that wish. That's a horrible, horrible thought. It really is. Do what you can. We can parse through the meaning of Romans, which we've done, and we can parse through the meaning of these two illustrations, and and we should give it serious thought. But, But the emphasis of our Lord is you be at peace as much as possible with everyone. You be caring for people in the inner person. Colossians 3, 8. 
Paul says, you must now put off all these things. Put away anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Then in verse 12 of Colossians 3, he says, put on then, what? As God's chosen one, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So you've heard that it was said, you shall not murder. No, not only shall you not murder, you need to deal with sinful anger. You need to put that aside and you need to seek reconciliation. Shocking statement, shocking After the election of President Trump in 2016, of course, that shocked many, many people, especially our coastal elites, for lack of a better term, right? The people on the coasts, they're fairly liberal. And and one of these people, a journalist, said, what in the world just happened? And instead of just casting aspersions and writing hateful articles, this journalist named Alexandra decided to go and try to understand what happened. And so she took her family and kids and started to tour some of these red counties or red states around the country and began to sit down and interview and talk to people about these things. She eventually wrote an article about it. Um, It was a very kind, thoughtful article. She was not being, you know, condescending or a jerk or anything. But in one of these, in one of these things, she was talking to a gentleman um, and they were talking about, you know, their differences and the politics and stuff. Her kids were, I think, close by. And this man said, All of these people are Nancy Pelosi's grandchildren, is what he said. Well, Alexander's last name, Pelosi, okay? This is a true story. So it's Nancy Pelosi's daughter that was going around doing this. And so she's sitting there, and and she says, would you like to meet Nancy Pelosi's grandchildren? And of course, that changed everything, didn't it? It just brings a new perspective, just brings a new perspective. You know, it's easy to be angry with someone at a distance, right? Well, you know, I'm here at church and I have my Bible open. That person's, you know, 50 miles away, 100 miles away, whatever it is. It's easy to be angry with someone at a distance. But friends, that doesn't make it any less sinful. Doesn't make it any less sinful. And, And I just want you to think about this. Think about someone who you are really frustrated with it might be someone you know. It might be someone you don't know. It might be a politician. I don't know. Anybody. I'm sure all of us are able to foster in our minds someone who really frustrates us. Okay? And, and in that, we're tempted towards sinful anger towards them. Right? And as long as they're far away, we can speak and think hideous things in our mind. But if that person were to show up at your house, that person were to come into your life, you run into them, what are you going to do? How are you going to treat them? What's going to be your goal? Is your goal to let them know the, the spew and vileness of your heart towards them? I hate you. You deserve to die and I want to watch. Or, you know, we think those things. It's horrible. Or are we going to say, you know what? I'm going to put to death my sin. I'm going to put on compassion I'm going to forgive. I'm going to do what I can to reconcile if reconciliation needs to be found. And I'm going to try to let the light of Christ shine through me into a dark, dark situation. Some of us could never imagine a political opponent of ours coming into our home. Well, what if they did? What if they did? How would you speak to this person? How would you engage? And maybe, just maybe, think about, that's how I should be thinking about them. Not just, not just okay, I'm going to have these hateful thoughts, but when they come, I'll, I'll treat them well. No, treat them at a distance the way that you're treating them if they were present. Treat them at a distance the way you would treat them if they were present. Of course, friends, you know that the ultimate battle, the ultimate um, irreconcilable difference is with us and God outside of faith in Christ. We're enemies. We're spiritually dead. 
the wrath of God is upon us. So, so that's the first place of reconciliation that we need to have dealt with. And we know that Jesus, God, is more than willing to deal with that. And that's just great news, isn't it? Christ bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might be brought to God, reconciled to God. And friends, the good news, and again, we see this in the world around us, there is absolutely no restraint to some of the hate that's just ongoing and growing. But if you are in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in you who is coming to you and speaking to you and pointing you to passages like this and saying, stop. I've forgiven you 100%. It's all gone. It's all taken care of. Now live it. Live it. Live it. I quoted this earlier. Oh, meant to, sorry, I didn't include those. Here's that quote from your bulletin. Anger shows contempt. You are better than they. You are smarter, more righteous. You are above and they are below. Anger tears down. It ki- anger tears down. It kills relationships. And then this one I thought about putting in too. Thomas Watson. Sin gratifies Satan. When lust or anger burn in the soul, Satan warms himself at this fire. Does Satan find you comfortable? Does he enjoy coming around and putting his hands up close to you? Two ways we harbor sinful anger in our hearts. We are not considering the gravity of its wickedness and we are not seeking to offload it and be reconciled to those with whom we struggle. Jesus demands that we understand the gravity of sinful anger and offload it in pursuit of reconciliation. May the Lord bless the preaching of God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, we do pray right now, and, and we thank you that, Lord, in your kindness to us, you do not let us get away with just 